Yeah, uh, hi and welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, I'm happy that I was invited to give you a short summary talk about one of our projects. We are working on many different projects, uh, usually uh, screening millions of small molecules and identify inhibitor molecules, agonists, and antagonists. But today I want to talk to you about a, a related project that may be uh, useful to you all, hopefully. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about the detection of a native ligand orientation using interfacial rigidity. And yeah, why uh, should we care uh, about binding mode prediction, how a small molecule binds to a protein? I mean, most of you are studying proteins and you are curious how a ligand might interact with a protein. Um, but beyond that, also, if you are working on um, inhibitor discovery, antagonist discovery, you don't know how a certain ligand binds to a binding pocket in the protein. You are curious how, uh, how can we predict that? And also, if you are fitting uh, ligands in crystal structures, that would be another application. And yeah, I'm showing you uh, just an example of the crystal structure of carboxypeptidase A with a uh, byproduct analog inhibitor, l succinate bound to it. And in green, here in green, uh, that's the crystal structure. We pulled this down from PDB, uh, the protein data bank. And in blue and yellow, I'm showing you two exemplary uh, docking posts. So if you would, for example, use a computation approach, you could sample docking poses that just look like this. But um, how do we know if we don't know what the crystal structure looks like, the green one? How do we know what's better, the blue one, the yellow one? Are we close? Is our prediction a good prediction? So we came up with a uh, hypothesis. Um, so what we think is, uh, it has been observed also, or there's evidence in experimental studies. What we think is, um, the more flexible a binding pocket is, the worse the docking pose. Or if we have a, a bad docking pose, we have a flexible binding pocket. And vice versa, we can say, or we hypothesize, um, that a near-native binding mode uh, corresponds to a rigid structure. And one thing uh, you may think about, why, why is that? Uh, is the coupling between interaction, for example. You're forming new interaction in the binding interface between the protein and the ligand. And yeah, if you think about, let's say, uh, crystallography, uh, some um, proteins can't be crystallized so easily, or not at all, in the absence of the native ligand. So it would be one uh, kind of uh, piece of evidence that uh, ligand binding kind of stabilizes the protein structure. And also, experimentalists are exploiting this idea for uh, the so-called uh, thermal flow assays. So they do an experimental screening for ligands, and what they do is they um, measure the melting temperature of a protein, and they observe if the ligand is bound, the melting temperature is higher, so the protein is more thermal stable. So that was just an idea, uh, can, we, can we predict this computationally? So these are just experiments, but can we use this um, idea to predict a binding mode, a near-native binding mode? And yeah, here I'm showing you another crystal structure of chorus-made uh, mutase and uh, ligand or small molecule bond with the prevenate. And um, so the color scale here, of the arrows, uh, I colored them on purpose. It's basically a small legend here. And what the blue color means is basically we uh, predict blue uh, domains to be rigid, and the yellow or red ones are the flexible domains of a protein. And Gray, the gray is an isostatic uh, domain. So what that means, if you we use a graph theory, uh, ideas from graph theory. So what that basically means is, imagine a bridge. You have a bridge. You have a certain number of struts, and the struts are basically analog to your um, covalent and non-covalent bonds. And it's, at some point, you can remove certain struts from the bridge without crashing the bridge. But at some point, if you remove one more strut, the uh, bridge might collapse. And that is the isostatic state, right? It's just rigid. And uh, yeah, in, in order to compute that, uh, or to make this prediction, whether the domain or the protein is rigid or not, we use a tool uh, called Proflex that was developed by uh, Leslie Kuhn and uh, Michael Falk. He was in the physics department a few years back at MSU. And yeah, we use this approach primarily also because it's fast, so we can make this prediction in one second on a normal computer, and we want to sample a lot of docking poses, so we also wanted an approach that is computational feasible to test our hypothesis. And yeah, this is just one example, so I haven't mentioned it yet. So that would be a near native docking pose, a more rigid uh, binding pocket here, and that would be on the left, that would be a bad docking pose, where the binding pocket is more flexible. And yeah, for one protein that obviously works, but does it also generalize in to other protein, uh, protein folds. So we took a larger data set of uh, 30 structures, 
uh, from PDE. And on the left side, we further split it up into two parts. On the left side, the hollow structures. These are structures from PDE where the protein has been crystallized in the presence of the ligand. And on the right, the APO structure, um, I think it's the more interesting case. These are uh, protein structures from PDB uh, that have been um, solved in absence of the ligand. So the side chains of the protein are not pre-conformed to the ligand binding. Because the challenge is, okay, binding, uh, binding mode of the prediction of the ligand is one thing, the orientation and conformation of the ligand, but we also want to uh, predict the um, conformations of the side chain in the protein. We have to sample them as well. So APO structures are more like the real uh, case scenario where you don't know uh, the ligand bound state. Uh, and just to, uh, just to give you an idea for the numbers that we use to um, quantify what near native means. So we use the RBC, the root mean square deviation, the distance between atoms. And if we have, uh, again, uh, this is the uh, protein binding pocket that I showed you in the beginning from carboxy peptidase A. So again, in green, the crystal structure. And just to give you a feeling for the numbers, uh, the yellow one would correspond to a 1.8 angstrom RMSD, uh, almost near uh, almost yeah, the crystal pose. And the blue one uh, would correspond to a docking pose that has a 2.8 angstrom RMSD. And usually in the field, 2.5, uh, the two would be considered near native. 2.5 is still passable. So 2.8 is not really near native anymore. I wouldn't call this near native. So just to give you a feel for our measurement of uh, near native, how we quantify this. And now we uh, developed, uh, based on our hypothesis, that the protein uh, binding pocket becomes more rigid if uh, it's in a more near native state. So um, we developed a score. I won't go into too much detail because uh, I only have a few minutes left. Uh, just wanted to show you the results when we use our scoring metric based on our hypothesis. And yeah, um, to show you first of all this plot, we call this enrichment plot. So uh, all you can read this is basically on the x-axis is the uh, uh, RMSD of our docking pose. And on the y-axis I plotted uh, the results of all 30 proteins that I showed you before. And for each protein we have a range of different docking poses. So we, what we want to do is we, use, uh, or we want to use our scoring function and see can our scoring function, function detect a near native binding pose. Just to uh, help a little bit with the interpretation of this plot. So if I just go there and take an um, arbitrary threshold, I told you 2.5 is still passable. If I go to the x-axis at 2.5 and I read from the y-axis, I can say in 27 out of 30 cases we predicted a binding pose that was uh, 2.5 angstrom or lower. So it seems like it works pretty good. So also just for comparison, if I would always select the worst locking pose from all, all my 30 protein set, I would get something like this uh, solid curve here. So just uh, in comparison, and um, if I always would select the best docking pose, I would get the dashed line. So just to give you a feeling how our method uh, behaves in general. But also more interesting, um, so that we are of course not the first uh, people who try to predict the binding mode. So there are other, uh, many other approaches out there. Usually these other approaches, they focus more on, uh, they use uh, simpler false fields and compute uh, sum of the energy terms. So it's an additive sum, they add different terms. Now it's, uh, it's more like about the coupling of interactions, so the cooperativity uh, inside the binding pocket, so that the right, uh, at the right position, the right combination of interactions is important for rigidifying the binding pocket. But yeah, to uh, see if our method, I mean, that looks okay, but is it really uh, competitive, or how does it uh, compare to other methods out there? So we took um, maybe the most commonly used uh, methods, the methods that have been developed over the 20, uh, last 20 years or so. Uh, maybe you've heard of some of them, like X-score, doc 6 Amber score PostScore, autodoc Ina, and DocScore X. And I just put our method in comparison to the others. And yeah, uh, it doesn't outperform any other method, method but what's uh, Nice to see is, I mean, we tested a hypothesis, and apparently you can also use this hypothesis or scoring metric to have a really competitive uh, scoring function. And also to uh, draw your attention to uh, these here. So our yellow one, again, is our uh, side interlock score uh, using our um, rigidity metric. And we don't make a really bad prediction here. I mean, the worst prediction is around uh, 3.8, and other methods, Sometimes have problems with uh, certain um, 
coding cases. I think that's due because uh, usually these methods are, they use a data set to fit their method. They have uh, different coefficients. And they take the uh, um, crystal structures to fit these uh, coefficients. And I told you before, the APO set is maybe more like the uh, real case scenario where the side chains of the protein are not pre-conformed to the ligand. So if I just zoom in on the APO uh, set here, so what I can see here is also our method uh, is competitive, but also other methods have the most problems on this APO structure. So in a lot of cases, other methods uh, make some really uh, bad errors. They would predict uh, the best locking pose up to 10 angstrom here, which is really a little bit uh, dangerous, for example, if you are interpreting an enzymatic uh, reaction or protein ligand interaction. So what you really don't want is a really bad prediction. Maybe the ligand got uh, flipped in the binding site or something like that. And yeah, that's just our approach in a nutshell to just uh, maybe summarize uh, these ideas. So testing an hypothesis, we found that we could use this for a competitive uh, scoring function that we can use for binding prediction and, for example, in docking applications. And here we also saw that it's a quite robust metric. It doesn't make any uh, mistakes based on these diverse proteins. And also we have a new information of signal here, the cooperativity of ones. I haven't shown you a plot, but I also did a correlation analysis. And what I found is that other scoring functions, I mean, they all work quite similarly. They use energy terms that they sum up. They have a very high covariance or correlation. So they are very, very similar. Ours, uh, is almost uncorrelated to other scoring functions or the information signal that we measure, which will also, for example, be interesting in a future application to build a scoring function that uses different features such as the rigidity or these energy terms and making a, a more powerful scoring function. So taking this as a new signal that might be useful to improve uh, the field overall. And yeah, um, if you are interested in trying this out in practice or we have, uh, if you want to apply to your project, we also uh, have a software package uh, called Cytotalog. So you can maybe go to uh, Leslie's website. There's a link there. I put a tutorial and uh, documentation up on uh, GitHub. And yeah, we also have, if you, I mean, this is just a brief talk. Uh, I can't tell you about everything uh, related to this project. But we also have uh, paper and proteins. It's currently in press. Uh, you can already uh, read the early view uh, version of it on the web. And yeah, then lastly, let me thank uh, my lab members. So we are a pretty small lab, uh, but a very productive lab. We have uh, many projects. Just showed you a summary of one of the projects. And yeah, uh, I want to thank Leslie for all the guidance and advice, and Joe, uh, Joseph Benister Buffing, who uh, helped me uh, collecting the data set or preparing the data set, the 30 diverse structures, creating the docking poses, and making sure that we have something uh, to work with. And yeah, Alex Wolf, uh, he's an undergrad researcher who joined our lab about two years ago now. And yeah, um, I mean, we worked together as a team, so he was also kind of involved in this project as gives tips and feedback. I mean, we worked uh, very well together. And yeah, um, by that, I just also want to thank you again for the invitation to give you a brief talk here. And yeah, thank you.